Let's talk about behavioral neuroscience. Neuroscience is the study of the nervous system. The nervous system can be broken down into smaller compartments, beginning with the peripheral and central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system can be divided into the autonomic, or visceral, and the somatic nervous system, which are involved in sensory and motor functions. The central nervous system can be divided into the brain and spinal cord. The brain is further divided into several regions, which are involved in various tasks. At the foundation of neuroscience is the work of Ramon Santiago y Cajal. He published his work on the nervous system called the Neuron Doctrine, where he argued that the nervous system was made up of cells that communicated with each other at tiny junctions called synapses. Fun fact, his dream was to become an artist, but his father urged him to become a doctor instead. He went on to lay the foundations for what would later become the pinnacle of neuroscience and even won a Nobel Prize in 1906. The brain is made up of approximately 80 billion cells. Modern research has discovered that the brain is made up primarily of two types of cells, glia and neurons. Glia constitute 90% of the brain cells, but until fairly recently haven't been studied in great detail. We now know that glia are responsible for a number of important functions in the nervous system in spite of not being as fast as neurons. The five major glial cells are astrocytes, radial glial, microglia, Schwann cells, and oligodendrocytes. Astrocytes are star-shaped. They aid in blood flow across brain regions, remove waste from dead neurons, and even modulate synchronization of action potentials. The radial glial form in the ventricular zone during embryonic development. They provide a transport system to different brain regions for newly born neurons. Microglia are the immune system of the nervous system. They remove microorganisms and waste. Schwann cells are found in the peripheral nervous system and they act as a myelin sheath. There are many cells per axon. Oligodendrocytes are found in the central nervous system and they also act as a myelin sheath, except they're much bigger than the Schwann cells and so one of the oligodendrocytes can myelinate many axons. Neurons are special in that they generate electrical impulses called action potentials, which are used in communication across neurons in different regions in the body. Each action potential takes about one millisecond, and they're happening all over the body and brain all the time. Another fun fact, action potentials generate just enough electricity to process the words coming out of my mouth and into your ears. Neurons come in many morphologies, but share similar structures. Dendrites are the tree-like extensions that receive information from other neurons. The cell body contains the nucleus, which holds the DNA of the neuron. The axon is the tail-like extension that sends signals to the axon terminal, where chemicals are released into the open space called the synapse and target other neighboring neurons. Neurons can also be classified by the projections from their cell bodies. Unipolar neurons are going to have one process projecting from the soma, or the cell body. The bipolar neurons are going to have two processes sticking off of the soma, and the multipolar neurons are going to have several different processes sticking out from the soma of the neuron. The three main types of neurons are excitatory, inhibitory, and modulatory. The excitatory neurons increase the likelihood of an action potential, the inhibitory decrease the likelihood of an action potential, and the modulatory have multiple effects on the receiving neuron. These are often called specialized neurons because they can often have very specific effects on the body or brain. This begs the question, how do neurons communicate with one another? The answer is through electrochemical signaling. I talked about how action potentials are generated sending electrical signals through the axon, where those signals then trigger the release of chemicals, hence electrochemical signaling. Neurotransmitters are chemicals released at the synapse of the presynaptic neuron onto the postsynaptic neuron. There are thousands of these chemicals in the brain, each producing various effects. Another question we might ask is, can a single neuron release more than one type of neurotransmitter? We'll definitely get to this question, but before that, I want to go ahead and introduce some terminology used in neuroscience. The presynaptic neuron is the neuron that is releasing neurotransmitters. The postsynaptic neuron receives neurotransmitters from the presynaptic neuron. An efferent is where the neuron sends the axons to, and afferent is where the neuron receives their input from. Local circuit neurons, they send these short-range efferents. Projection or principal neurons send long-range efferents. Henry Hallett Dale argued that a single neuron typically releases similar neurotransmitters from all of its synapses. This became known as Dale's principle. It led to the classification of neurons on the basis of what neurotransmitters they release. For instance, neurons found in parts of the basal ganglia would be considered dopaminergic because they release primarily dopamine. Current research has discovered a few exceptions to the rule, but it's still considered accurate. Let's look at some of the ways in which we can see the brain in action. Functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, uses magnetic fields to measure blood oxygen level dependent signals, or BOLT signals. Some of the pros include the fact that it's non-invasive, and it's great for looking at how the brain changes in response to stimuli. The cons are that it's expensive, it's difficult to use, and it has low spatial and temporal resolution, meaning that the pictures are often going to be hard to look at in great detail. Another way is through electrophysiology or single cell recordings. An electrode may be used to measure the neuron spike activity, or in other words, how often the neuron fires. Some of the pros include the fact that multiple electrodes may be used at once at different parts of the neuron. This can be done at high precision and accuracy, and it also has a high signal to noise ratio. 
Some of the cons include that it's invasive, and there are ethical issues regarding its use on animals.